Welcome to the Richard Blackby Leadership Podcast, helping people take their leadership to the next level. Brought to you by Blackby Ministries International. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of the Richard Blackaby Leadership Podcast. My name is Sam Camp, and I'll be your host as always. And I'm joined by the man who needs no introduction, the namesake of the podcast, Richard Blackaby. Good to be with you, Sam. Oh, it's always a pleasure. So we are looking again today at another uh, another biography of a leader in days yeah. gone by. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've done quite a few of these. I, I think some of our listeners, this is their their favorite. Uh, type of a podcast that we that do warms my heart i know Bi- I, I knew it would biographies of leaders in the past yeah there's, there's nothing like it so uh you know this has sort of become a, a fan favorite if you will <laughs> this segment and so uh who are we looking at today richard well uh sam one of my favorite people from the past a complicated uh person uh, as all these folks are but uh i want to look at the duke of marlborough i've mm. uh, i've referenced him before and uh, I just felt like it's time we, we waded in uh, to him, and especially in light of the fact that uh, you and I were just uh, in England, and yeah. we actually did some footage at the Duke of Marlborough's palatial mansion. Yes, it, 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 it was enormous and uh, quite, quite something to behold. It was. And uh, if you uh, were hoping that uh, by the time you're listening to this podcast, you'll be able to go to the show notes. And we actually did a video in yeah. front of uh, Lennon Palace. And uh, you also did some uh, pictures on the inside. And um, I, it's just pretty spectacular. And so yeah. this particular one, we always like for people to go to the show notes and get uh, other you know references to books I may have mentioned or whatever. But uh, on uh, these show notes, we'll have a reference to the biography that I'm basing a lot of this on, plus a little video of me actually on site, on location. On location, in, reporting uh, live. <laughs> <laughs> in England, just uh, done just done a week or so ago. So Yeah, that was, you know, that was really special, I think, to, uh, to be able to be there and, and see uh, the place where so much of this history that we often talk about takes place. And, and, and you know, even just being in Oxford... And in London, and seeing all of these places that 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 have history that go back so far, yeah, and and with so many well well known household names, yeah, like Queen Elizabeth, Winston Churchill, and when you uh, and you go up to like we went by the the tomb of uh, Queen Elizabeth and mm-hmm. uh, Queen Mary, and and when you look at that, you know you studied you've read for years about these people, and you you realize that in their day they terrorized people they ruled countries with an iron fist uh they were uh so famous that hundreds of years later people still study their names but yet inevitably you walk by and they're in a little stone uh tomb mm-hmm. uh, uh, and that's all that remains it's just you know no matter how powerful you were in history right we all have the same end and there might just be a little plaque on the floor of Westminster Abbey to remind people that you're buried underneath somewhere, but uh, you realize we all just have a limited amount of time to make a difference, and then we'll all end up uh, going the same way. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's why, you know, I think that we're we're doing this and, and we're helping leaders take their leadership to the next level because we all, you know, are given a, a finite number of days and, and why not make the most and, yeah. and make the greatest impact. And someone who has made a great impact Getting back to the Duke of Marlborough, the topic of our yeah. podcast today, yeah. Well, so uh, so so, why did you choose it? And we know, you know, if, if anyone's been listening for any amount of time, you know, the Duke of Marlborough has has inevitably cropped up in in a number of podcasts, and it's so, not always uh, easy working the Duke of Marlborough into every conversation. No, no, but I think you, you if anyone could find a way to do it, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it would be you. Uh, so tell us about you know why have we picked uh, the Duke of Marlborough and why specifically him. Okay, well, Duke, the Duke, uh, he's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, uh, of course, is because his uh, descendant, uh, about nine uh, Dukes later, was uh, Winston Churchill. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Churchill was actually born in the Duke of Marlborough's home and uh, was Winston's uh, father was the second born child. And so... If his father had been the firstborn son, 
than Winston Churchill would have been the Duke of Marlborough as well eventually. Mm-hmm. But because his dad was the second born, uh, he his uncle was the Duke of Marlborough. But uh, so he so he's famous for that reason. Um, he also, if you've ever been to his palace, uh, I believe they said it's the largest non royal palace. Yeah. Uh, maybe the only, I can't remember if they said the only. You know, I think if I recall, it was the, the largest secular palace that they said, non-royal secular yeah. palace, I think in the world. Uh, well, it's certainly in England. In the, yeah, well, yeah, certainly, certainly in, in England the UK. And, yeah. But um, anyway, you look at that and you think, um, wow, that the, the, the nation must truly have been grateful for what he did for it. Uh, yeah. Which is interesting because... Churchill is born in this magnificent palace, which hopefully, if you go to our show notes, you'll get uh, you'll see some of the video of that. But uh, uh, it's it, you might argue that uh, perhaps uh, after the Mar- uh, Duke of Marlborough, perhaps the Duke of Wellington, and then Churchill, probably some of the greatest. And you you could throw in Admiral Nelson uh, as well, probably some of the greatest. Um, champions of England and Great Britain that there ever were. Mm-hmm. And um, so a couple things about Marlboro. Of course, his um, his name is actually John Churchill. He, he's a Churchill. Marlboro right. is simply his title when he's made a duke. Uh, but his name is John Churchill. And interestingly, his father is named Winston. So the Duke of Marlboro's father is Winston Churchill. Uh, hmm. And so... Uh, Again, cre- you know, very creative with the names. Yeah, I think you know, in th- those folks, it's like why, why change a good thing? Yeah. So, but uh, uh, Winston was uh, in, during the Great Revolution in England, where they uh, the the Royalist forces were fighting against uh, Cromwell and uh, the the Parliamentarians. Um, Churchill's um, uh, his side, his family chose to support the king. And of course, the king lost, and the king ultimately was beheaded, and all those who supported the king ended up in big trouble. And uh, right. some were killed and arrested. Uh, a lot of them lost their property, and basically, Churchill lost his his property and his fortune, lost everything by supporting the king. And so, uh, the Duke of Marlborough, John Churchill, grew up in relative poverty. Uh, in want, um, and and that 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 left a mark on him. He uh, never had money. His parents didn't have money. Uh, eventually, when uh, the monarchy is brought back to England, then Winston Churchill uh, is is given some money once again, and and given some place. But uh, but he suffered greatly by his for his loyalty. And so that's kind of interesting because the Duke of Marlborough then is going to be always aware that he doesn't want to pick the wrong side. Yeah. <laughs> he watched his father pick the losing side and um, and watched him suffer really the rest of his life. In fact, the coat of arms for the Churchills uh, basically says faithful but unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind wow. of summed up uh, the, the original Winston quite well. He was he's faithful, but unfortunate as a result and, and so you know and perhaps could that could also sum up the winston churchill's much of his life yeah yeah you know faithful to the, his country but unfortunate up until yeah in so World many ways that doesn't mean because you're you're a good person that things always work out yeah. for you unfortunately yeah. but so uh marlboro uh through really a series of uh of fortunate circumstances uh now we we look on this from our vantage point and we're appalled but uh but basically uh when Winston Churchill be- finds favor with uh, the king uh his family is finds favor and uh one of John Churchill's um sisters ends up basically becoming the mistress of the <laughs> of the prince of wales and um and because of that she gets some jobs because she's found favor with the prince uh and the king's family then john churchill is given a job in the army and so on and and it gives their family an opportunity to have some uh, closeness to government and so on and churchill ultimately is given a chance to serve in the army you know he's uh, he he always struggled because even in the army, even if you you were a really good soldier, you still couldn't really advance unless you you paid for the office. 
And so if you were a wealthy, a son of a a wealthy noble, every time that you were going to be promoted, your dad would just pay the fee and you'd get promoted. But, uh, but Churchill didn't really have that opportunity. And so he had to do everything the hard way. Money always came very hard for him. Yeah. And, uh, and as a result, there's two things you kind of see, um, with Churchill. One, One thing is, nothing's necessarily handed to him. In fact, oftentimes he has to put in years of wilderness wanderings, if you will, before he gets his break. In fact, he doesn't really lead a, a major army until he's 52 years old. And so he's, he puts in years of being faithful when uh, things aren't going his way. And, uh, and because of that, he doesn't always have a lot of income. And so uh, one, of the, one of the character flaws, you might say, about... Marlboros. He's pretty cheap. You know, most nobles in that day were yeah. expected to be pretty extravagant and generous and throwing money around. And, uh, but, uh, but Marlboro doesn't. In fact, at one point Churchill, by the way, the, this, the biography that I base this on is written by Winston Churchill. Um, Churchill greatly admired his, uh, ancestor and, mm-hmm. uh, one, and, and his ancestor had been, uh, critiqued on it for a number of different reasons. One of them just being that he was fairly frugal and uh, seemed to be uh, very concerned about uh, having enough money for things. And interestingly, one of the reasons Churchill wrote the book as well is that he was often in dire straits financially. And Winston had to write books just to pay his bills. Mm -hmm. So he's writing about a impoverished ancestor uh, who never had enough money so that he has enough money. Yeah. But uh, so Churchill writes a two volume uh, book. It's about uh, 2,300 pages. I've read every page in uh, this uh, biography. It's a great read, by the way. If you've never read a biography or a history written by Winston Churchill, uh, Churchill, he, he, he works pretty hard on his research, but uh, it's really his uh, language. I mean, he's just very picturesque. And. Hmm. He has a, just a number of phrases that you you read it, and I would, in the midst of the 2,300 pages, you're reading, and you just kind of stop and smile, like, Winston, that was good. You know, <laughs> I, I, I love that little phrase. He has a way of just coining a phrase that makes you stop, and you, you kind of try to picture what it, it is he's just said. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, but basically, but it's not a. It's certainly not a quick read. No, uh, uh, no. It's, I'm looking it's at a, the size a, of these, and they're you know, it's well, a, it's I had a to, two volume set. When I would take it on uh, airplanes, I you had to claim a, it as uh, carry on luggage. Yeah, you know, yeah. But, I was going to say that's yeah. going to that's going to have to that, go the, under the seat in front Delta, of you. There. Yeah, that's Delta not, wanted to know <laughs> like the, to factor this in to their. Yeah, uh, it's like, this really throws off the balance of the plane, yeah. sir. Could you? Uh, <laughs> we're going to need you to move forward with us. Uh, but the, I, I suppose the thing about um, Marlboro that is his real claim to fame is that he, uh, in his day, like he's born in, uh, in 1650, and he lives to be about 72 years old. So uh, he dies in 1722. And so those are the days overlapping when Louis the Fourteenth of the king of France was uh, ruling. And he, he ruled for, I think, over 50 years. And um, that was, in many ways, the height of France's glory. They were the superpower on the continent of Europe. And, uh, and so they are constantly having to deal with this superpower France. And, mm-hmm. uh, and France, when you're on the continent, nobody has armies as big and powerful as France does. Yeah. And so for these English to ship over their army to the continent, and then to have to join up with uh, some of the Dutch uh, soldiers and to try to combine an army of several different nationalities to fight against the French was an enormous undertaking. Uh, It was just considered almost impossible. Mm -hmm. But uh, in Marlborough's heyday, he is going to lead this um, hodgepodge of uh, English and Dutch soldiers and fight for for 10 years. He will fight on the continent uh, against the French and never loses a battle, fights several major, major battles, uh, has to uh, besiege a number of castles and fortresses and uh, uh, capture cities and so on. And whether he's capturing a a fortress or fighting an an enemy army in open battle on the battlefield, 
he never loses. And it's just remarkable when you realize for 10 years up against various uh, French armies and at, at times with a very divided folks inside his own command. For instance, the Dutch had a rule that they did not have to obey Marlborough except in a battle. When they're in the battle, he was the, the general. But mm-hmm. on days when they were marching and when they were deciding what to do next, they had an independent command. They could do what he suggested, but they didn't have to. And so if you could imagine, <laughs> you know, half your yeah, army that, doesn't mm-hmm. have to obey you except on battle day. Um, the diplomacy he had to use and the tact and the persuasion was amazing. And then, and yet not to ever lose a battle, hmm. uh, oftentimes fighting armies bigger than his own. It tells you something about him. And by the time he had won several very decisive battles, including one at Blenheim, um, that is why ultimately the, the queen of England voted to, or, or ordered to build a, a, a monument to, uh, the Duke of Marlborough, and that's what became uh, what became Blenheim Palace, mm-hmm. which is located, I don't know, 30 minute drive or so outside of Oxford, and um, and it was meant to be a memorial uh, for time ever after of the glorious victories of Marlborough uh, for England that enabled it to stand on its own uh, toe to toe with France, and uh, gave them respectability internationally and so on, and. Uh, and so that's why he is uh, such a famous person. He, he fought against great odds with a greatly handicapped in many ways and did so over a decade. Of every, every spring, he would go over back to the continent and lead the army and fight all through the summer into the fall and, uh, hmm. and never lose. And so that uh, makes people argued. In fact, uh, they once asked the Duke of Wellington, himself, who was a better general, him or Marlborough. And Wellington deferred to Marlborough. Uh, they, just in his day, uh, they just felt like uh, over that prolonged period of time with those uh, challenges that he may well have been one of the finest generals that the, the English ever produced. And so yeah. that's why he, um, you know, we know a lot more about the Duke of Wellington, we know more about Churchill. But if you go back before any of those, uh, the Duke of Marlborough is certainly uh, the the man that put England on the world stage. Yeah, well, he certainly has an impressive uh, record. And uh, we're going to take a quick break here, and we'll dive a little bit deeper into that and, and what made Marlborough Marlboro. Yeah. Twice a year, Black Bee Ministries hosts a spiritual leadership coaching workshop in the Atlanta area. The focus of this workshop is learning how to ask the right questions to help move people onto God's agenda. The next workshop is November 4th through 6th, and registration is open now. The early bird rate is available until October 1st, and space is limited. To find out more and to register, visit blackbeecoaching.org. Links will be in the show notes. Uh, as we said at the top of the show, Richard... Uh, we've done quite a few of these, and uh, it, it may come as no su- surprise uh, to those listening that there's always something that these leaders had to overcome uh, in order to to be the person that, that they ended up being and, and being known for and, and all that. So maybe quickly just walk us through what are the things that Marlboro had to overcome, and uh, as a result, what, what kind of a person did that make him? Well, uh, yeah, as we mentioned earlier, he uh, grew up in poverty. His father was uh, disgraced, and so he uh, he never knew much money, and mm-hmm. he's always aware of that, always trying to make money as best he could. Uh, and so that made it challenging when you're also trying to rise above the fray. And you, right. At times he would be accused of, uh, of corruption, which uh, was never really proven— uh, but but uh, because he was known as someone who needed money, any time he handled money for the army or whatever, he'd be have to face some of those challenges. But um, but uh, uh, there's several things uh, that are kind of interesting. As Churchill writes about him, uh, he Churchill says it is said that famous men are usually the product of unhappy of an unhappy childhood, the stern compression of circumstances. Uh, the twinges of adversity, the spur of slights and taunts in early years are needed to evoke that ruthless fixity of purpose and tenacious mother wit without which great actions are seldom accomplished. 
certainly uh, little in the environment of the young John Churchill should have uh, deprived him of this stimulus. And by the various long descending channels there centered in him, uh, martial and dangerous fires. Well, I can certainly understand the uh, the ability of Churchill to write. Like that's <laughs> that's a pretty beautiful uh, excerpt there. Yeah, he. Uh, it, it was interesting um, how he Churchill just has a way with words. It's uh, that's quite beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he uh, and but a couple of things to say about that was that one he had he at one point Churchill says the thing about. Uh, uh, the Duke of Marlborough was he he couldn't afford to lose, so he never did. Hmm. He he always had political enemies that were uh, just ready to pounce on him. The, it just that to their frustration, he kept winning all their battles. And yeah, so the moment he would lose, if he were to lose a battle, his enemies in politics in the Parliament would have asked for him to be uh, removed, and someone more politically to their liking would have taken his place. And so. He, while he's on the battlefield, uh, and when it came to relating to his soldiers, even though he didn't uh, spend a lot of money on them, he always took good care of them, and yeah. he always uh, mingled about them. In fact, because he didn't spend a lot of money extravagantly, he, you know, the way he lived wasn't that much different than the way the soldiers did. So uh, they admired him. And of course, if your general never loses a battle. You, you sort of get loyal to him. You, right, you yeah. Want, you want to fight for him. When, when life and death is on the line, yeah. uh, um, the guy who doesn't lose is, is a good bet. But he uh, th- he had several things that were interesting. Uh, at one point, uh, when he starts out, he is actually uh, living under King Charles uh, the, the, fir- the second. And... Uh, King, uh, because his father basically, you know, took the side of the king, and then the king lost. Uh-huh. And so, uh, when the king, uh, when King Charles II returns, uh, comes back to the throne, um, now all of a sudden Marlborough has some clout, and he's brought back, and uh, so he remains loyal to Charles's son, King James uh, the Second. But King James announces that he's a Catholic, and this he's King of England, that's Anglican. And so ultimately, uh, there's a, a revolt to get rid of King James II. And Marlborough is, is King James's one of his number one officers, one of his number one soldiers. But uh, at a certain point, Marlborough will abandoned King James and joined the Protestants, joined the Anglicans. And uh, that always was a very difficult time for him and his reputation because King James had counted on him. And of course, Marlborough's father had gone down with the ship with supporting the king. But now Marlborough watched how his father suffered ever after for doing that. And Marlborough was determined not to go down with the ship but also, he is a very devout Protestant, and he watches King James trying to make England a Catholic nation again. And so so he abandons King James, and he joins King William, who's in, who invades England and takes over the throne with, with Queen Mary. But, uh, but, but it doesn't take long before King William and Mary, they don't trust Marlborough either, because even though Marlborough betrays King James, he continues to write to him and keep a relationship with him. And so, and we don't understand this now, but in England, if you're King William and you've come, he, William came over from the Netherlands and took over as King of England and booted King James out of England. But they were always worried King James II would come back. And King James is a Catholic. So he goes to France, which is the most powerful Catholic nation on the planet, mm-hmm. and they want him to go back. And so when you've got the most powerful nation trying to overthrow your your king and put their king in his place, there's always intrigue. There's always concern of invasion and what right. will the French do. And so uh, Marlboro, he kept writing and keeping up with the King James even after he abandoned him. and uh, And so that always kind of worried King William who's on the throne. <laughs> well right, right. You're one of my top soldiers, but you you keep writing like, the guy that I you served who, and threw out. Yeah. So and who keeps wanting to invade Great Britain and take it over again. So mm-hmm. 
So that ended up, there were various cause some tension. concerns, <laughs> and ultimately, um, Marble actually gets thrown into the Tower of London. Uh, hmm. And there, there actually was a, a slanderous uh, lie about him and some others. It was eventually proven to be false, but, uh, but for about five weeks, he languishes in the Tower of London. And while he's in the Tower of London, his youngest son dies. Hmm. If you can imagine how low you get, right. you're, you're, you're one of the top generals, military leaders in your country, but instead of being trusted by the king, you're thrown into the Tower of London where people usually check in, but they don't check right. out. And, uh, and then your son dies. Uh, and so it was a very, very low time for him. Eventually he's let out, but then instead of being brought back into the army, he's basically made to watch over uh, the princess Anne. And, and so he wants to go to the battlefield. Instead, he and his wife were told, go look after this uh, young princess. And so for, mm. for about six years, that's, um, that's all that he does. And, uh, and it looks like a complete waste of his time. He wants, th- there's battles being waged on the continent and he's babysitting a princess. Yeah. Uh, but eventually King William dies and King, Queen Anne becomes the queen. And lo and behold, this wonderful soldier who's become a good friend of hers and a protector, uh, she now makes him the top general. And she appoints him and says, I want you to, to lead all of England's forces. And so it's under Queen Anne that he used to babysit, essentially, yeah. that all of a sudden he gets his chance in the sun. And it's he's, now he's in his early 50s. And for the next 10 years, he becomes famous all over Europe as this general that never loses. Um, and, and, and it's Queen Anne that will eventually... Uh, pay and commission to build Blenheim Palace for him. Hmm. The interesting thing, though, is that uh, like so many leaders, you realize that um, life's always complicated. And for a lot of leaders, if you could just always operate on the battlefield, you might always do well. If you always just, you know, functioned in the business community, in the, in the office, uh, then perhaps uh, life would be very simple and you'd always win. But problem with a lot of these guys is that they have to go home. They yeah. have to deal with family. And uh, Marlborough is no exception. And Marlborough, when uh, he's just kind of starting out, he meets a young girl named Sarah Jennings, who is 15 at the time. And they uh, they fall in love with each other. And, uh, and they want to get married. But neither of them have any money. And so both of their parents want them to marry rich. Right. And his, and his father says, you know, I, I lost my fortune, so you need to marry into a fortune. And you're a young, talented, gifted young man. You, you could do that. But he wants to marry for love. And so he and Sarah ultimately get married. Churchill, in his own uh, interesting writing style, says that the, it was the only surrender that uh, the Duke of Marlborough ever uh, conceded <laughs> was uh, surrendering to, to Sarah. And yeah, yeah. Truly, he, he loves her, and uh, uh, and uh, so they, they are married, and all the stories are that uh, basically he they loved each other all their lives and were very close. But, uh, but Sarah is one of these very, very outspoken, domineering, uh, she's very anti-Catholic, and mm-hmm. very outspoken about that. And it's in a time where there are a lot of Catholics uh, in high power there. And uh, and so she is, um, like so many of us, what makes us strong also is our Achilles heel. Yeah. And so when she is entrusted to, to look out for this princess, Anne, well, then being a domineering, opinionated, intrusive person is maybe not so bad because... She looks out for Anne, and she speaks up and defends Anne, and shares her opinion with Anne, and and it it's it's a it can be very helpful to Anne. But now Anne's the queen, and Anne is the boss, right? And she's got this uh, this maid of honor that can that continues to express her strong opinions, and and after a while, it just gets to where she begins to offend the queen, and. Ultimately, the queen just has had enough of Sarah, and she strips Sarah of all of her titles and her positions, hmm. says, I don't want you to be a lady-in-waiting for me anymore, and uh, tells the 
tells Marlboro. Now, she likes Marlboro because he goes out and treats her politely and as a gentleman, and he goes off and wins all of her wars for her. But but she, the queen can't stand his wife anymore. Hmm. And so um, at one point, in a, a really a, a pathetic moment, Marlboro, and of course, there's a lot of money at stake here. If his wife is no longer serving the queen, a lot of influence, and there'll be other people that will take her place that can turn the queen against them. It's a very, you're very right, vulnerable. Right. So uh, Marlboro actually comes in before the queen, gets down on his knees and begs the queen to take his wife back. And wow. uh, and Churchill, in just that poetic language of his, says I mean, he's, he's an undefeated general in battle. He can lead massive armies and artillery and cavalry charges and uh, and then lead armies into battle and win them all. Yet standing before this woman, the queen, he is just a servant. Yeah. He's, he's not a victorious general. He's just the servant of the queen. And he gets on his knees and begs and she absolutely refuses and says, I, I, I will not change my mind. I your wife is done. And and so the sad thing with uh, Sarah Churchill was that she um, she was always, I mean, she's very uh, strongly opinionated and tended to be kind of combative. And so she is always going into battle with some. Now, if, she, if she's on your side, it's great because she will ravage uh, the enemy on your behalf and charge into any kind of uh, battle for, to defend you. But if she's upset with you, <laughs> you're, yeah. uh, she can be pretty miserable to deal with. And uh, ultimately, Marlboro's uh, two daughters both become alienated from their mother, and mm. they just want nothing to do with their mom anymore. They, All the kids adored Marlboro, but as Marlboro's getting older, his daughters didn't even want to be around their mother anymore. And wow. uh, very, very sad in, in some ways, uh, a woman that could not necessarily control some of those stronger urges and alienates herself from many. But uh, from all that we know in history, she and Marlboro themselves always loved each other, and she doggedly took care of him. But uh, sadly, he lives about three years uh, in the Blenheim Palace. They they never he he never lived to see it all completed. It's massive, but yeah. Uh, he li- they lived in the East Wing for about three years, and he suffered some strokes and ultimately dies. But um, he uh, it's interesting when you read about him on the battlefield, uh, it just talks about his serenity and his courage. And Churchill says that l- literally uh, victory depended sometimes on whether he rode his horse to the left or the right. And huh. when the battle was raging, uh, if you saw Marlboro riding by on his horse— all the soldiers would take heart. He, one point, Churchill says his appearance, his serenity, his piercing eye, his gestures, the tone of his voice, nay, the beat of his heart, uh, diffused a harmony upon all around him. Every word he spoke was uh, decisive. Victory often depended upon whether he rode half a mile to the east or to the west. Um, and uh, it, it's interesting. At one point in a in the, in an intense battle, Churchill says one of his general officers was retiring with a force of cavalry in disorder. Marlborough rode up to him and, uh, commanding a halt, remarked uh, with a certain uh, sarcasm, "Mr. Uh, Blank, uh, you are under a mistake. The enemy lies that way. You have nothing to do but to face him." And the day is your own. Whereupon the general returned to uh, with his squadron to the conflict. Hmm. And so here's a general that's fleeing in fear and in a rout. And Marlboro comes up and as if to kind of make fun to say, "Hey, you're you you, you somehow are mistakenly thinking the enemy is that way, yeah. <laughs> but you're going the wrong way. The enemy is the other way. Exactly. Just turn around and uh, all will be well." Uh, and uh, and it was, and it was another victory for Marlboro, but uh, such confidence uh, on the battlefield. And you see that with some leaders, because when it came to leading soldiers in battle, uh, he is unparalleled. But right. uh, but sometimes when it comes to managing his home and his daughters and his wife, and uh, when it comes sometimes uh, to his finances and mm-hmm. not succumbing to worry about how to pay the bills. Yeah. Um, that was a different story. 
And yeah, so often it's 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 strong in one area, but weak in another. Yeah, which uh, it's just really hard to be strong in every area, isn't yeah. it? And, yeah. And uh, and so sometimes though, in what you're called to do, your calling in life, your job, your career, uh, sometimes people will really get that right. But uh, and so they accomplish much in that field. But uh, but then you know the, the other thing just to say, and we say it kind of in our, in our uh, on the uh, video, but. Uh, uh, um, basically, the queen gave him a monument in Blenheim Palace, but it was uh, very, ex- I mean, it's huge, and it's very expensive to run. And it, it was something of a curse on his descendants because they yeah. had to pay for it. They had to keep pay the servants and keep pay for the upkeep and pay the utility bills. And yeah. uh, and uh, it became quite a burden. And uh, about several Marlboros later, the Marlboros are having to sell the library to try to, uh, to try to pay the bills. And I think it's, uh, the, the ninth Duke of Marlboro that actually marries, uh, Consuelo Vanderbilt. Uh, and they basically work out a financial arrangement where the Vanderbilt bills will put millions of dollars into Blenheim Palace to basically prop up the, the Duke of Marlboro. Yeah. And the Vanderbilts will get the, the prestige of having the Marlboro line merge with theirs. Yeah. Uh, but you never hear of another Marlboro that ever really accomplishes much. I mean, Churchill is from that line, but, uh, but anyone that's the actual Duke of Marlboro, right. You never really hear of them doing anything great again. It's, uh, and they, they live in the palace dedicated to a Marlboro doing great things. But none of them ever seemed to rise to the occasion. And, of course, that's what Churchill wanted to do. Churchill would play and go visit his, grand, his, his uh, aunt at the, uh, in the Marlboro Mansion and uh, Palace, and he would dream of doing something great for his country. And, of course, ultimately he does. Yeah. But uh, just because you get it passed down, just because your dad was great, your mom was great, doesn't mean you're great. You, right. you have to earn that yourself. And so Marlboro was a great... Uh, man, he overcame much, but uh, it took generations all the way down to Churchill, Winston Churchill, before one of his descendants uh, ultimately rose up and saved his nation just like he had. Hmm. Well, as you can tell, there's there's loads more to talk about uh, the Duke of Marlborough, and, and this is just a, a glimpse into what his life was, was and, and what his leadership was like, and so we'd encourage you to pick up your copy yeah. of the yeah. two volume set. If you ever do read uh, both volumes of the Duke of Marlboro by Churchill, send us a message. I'd love uh, to yes. hear from you. And yes, know absolutely. there's someone that, else. <laughs> yeah, there's at least one other person that's read them both. So uh, again, we'll, we'll leave it at that. And uh, Richard, thanks again. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If this is something you enjoyed, review us on Apple Podcasts and don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. If you have questions or comments, please email us at podcast at blackbee.org.